here and chat with me. You can open up the stream if you want. Okay. Um, oh, how do I do that? Actually, that's that's a. Uh, so to open up the stream, you just go just, to the YouTube channel and then. Just a little link. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So okay. then, if people end up being engaged in the chat, you can see the chat there. Or That's if they're cool. not engaged in the chat, then you can be <laughs> I can. Sad, sad alongside me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All sad. right. So uh, welcome again, Greg. It was a pleasure. Sad, sad alongside me, I guess. Oh, <laughs> I definitely mute that. oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, mute that, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was obviously a pleasure to have you uh, do the three-part, uh, you know, video series on the open quantum systems. Hopefully, then getting into more complicated topics later as sort of a, a sort of a setup is a really rewarding experience for me, being you know a first opportunity to sort of produce a video like that with a with a collaborator. That was really fun. Had a lot of uh, yeah, it was a great it was a great time. So so thanks again and uh, and and welcome to the stream. <laughs> thanks a lot john yeah and so it was it was a lot of fun making that video with you and it kind of tested me a little bit how do i put all the all my thoughts together into a, a coherent package there yeah it's, it's sort of weird when you're do, when you're doing sort of a research talk you're sort of yeah, any mistake is just like you know sort of a mistake you're just sort of trying to get through the material but then when you're trying to make a youtube video and it's it's just going to be there on the internet forever Right. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of pressure as far as that goes then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so one thing that we didn't really get into um in in the video of course is you know what your story is as a scientist i always think this is a fun sort of conversation to have so so er early on in say your childhood did you did did science catch your eye did physics catch your eye like what's the what's the story with how you you know sort of fell in love with physics yeah i guess it was more kind of from the mathy side like i always liked puzzles and building things it kind of like you know i kind of i had that type of mindset that i think fit well with math and then um i didn't really get interested in science until the end of high school i'd say for the most part but um and, and and it was really through math like i was i took like some chemistry and then a little bit of biology in the early years of high school and the kind of the less math there was the worse i did in the course usually <laughs> so <laughs> physics just kind of clicked with me okay um and uh kind of and i just suddenly i mean and even in my early years i i thought i was really bad at math too actually uh, because I was in French immersion and every math class was in French. <laughs> and, I, and it turned out that I just didn't know how to speak French. And that's fair. I was getting bad grades. But then <laughs> when I went to uh, English speaking like math classes later on, that's when I kind of realized, OK, this is this is clicking. And um, so, yeah, so it was, like, was it a surprise for you when you went into sort of grade in grade 11 physics? Like, you went to school in Ontario, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. In so, Waterloo. So, so when you went to um, when you went to grade 11 physics, it was sort of a surprise to you that you were good at physics? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And because it was, I don't know, it's kind of fascinating when you see that the equations can model anything real, right? I don't know that, like, when you see that a, you know, a, a pendulum swings with a certain period and then, oh, wait a minute, there's a differential equation that maps onto that. That, that was very interesting that there's that close relation between the two subjects for me. Yeah, it's almost surprising, I guess. Yeah. The first time, yeah. you, the first time you realize that you can do that, I guess it's very surprising. Yeah, it's a little spooky, almost. You're like, why should it be that way? And I mean, many people observe that too, right? But yeah, and then kind of, I applied actually then later on to engineering. Uh, okay. That was the first thing I applied to, and physics, and I got into both. But then, I kind of thought, okay, maybe there's a little more financial stability in engineering, so I first started on engineering and that did not go very well at all for me. It was the kind of programming and circuit side of things there that didn't go so well. And then I switched to physics and then suddenly I just started doing well and um, I stuck with it and it just kind of just realized that I have this love for the topic, you know, the, the more yeah. kind of mathematically inclined, I didn't really ever love the lab courses, but the theory courses is what really kind of just stuck with me, so. I see. And and did um, was it sort of location that determined what university you were going to be uh, applying to for undergrad, or was it more yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was location. So I was born in Waterloo, went to University of Waterloo. Yeah. Uh, just kind of stayed local, but it's it's it was a very good school too. So it wasn't like a you know a, a difficult choice to make when I got accepted. I did also apply to Laurier, but decided just Waterloo. There was a kind of there's a few more. There, there was a, just a larger department there, so that's why I ended up doing that at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Waterloo seems like it's a great undergrad experience for, or at least a great under, uh, undergraduate uh, education for, for yeah. folks. Definitely, definitely, yeah. It, it definitely, see, like in our department, it feels like there's a bigger presence from Waterloo than any, than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. It just, in our year, there are, are you alone, right? There's a <laughs> couple students, yeah, I think, even on your channel, right? I think James went to Waterloo as well, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. M multiple, multiple Waterloo alumni on the channel already. Mm -hmm. So, so while you're an undergrad, um, like, did did you have the idea early on in undergrad when you when you switched out of engineering that perhaps um, uh, that that research was something that you wanted to to give a try, or is that something that that comes along uh, sort of later? Yeah, I I guess. It was always an interesting idea to me. Like I did read all the kind of pop sci physics books, like uh, Brian Green, you know, Michio Kaku, all that stuff. So like the idea was interesting to me for sure, but it was kind of always a for the first few years kind of a seemed like a bit of a reach. But then when I realized I was doing well in all the kind of first few courses there, it, suddenly I I kind of got excited about the idea as I went on and on. And by the time I was in fourth year, I was like, okay, like that, this could be very interesting. And grad school sort of become oh, okay. interesting as an option. So <laughs> kind of a gradual increase towards that, basically. I, I appreciate the, the the impression I get is sort of like a go with the flow, like in, in the moment, what makes sense. I, I appreciate that about your story so far. <laughs> a, a little bit, yeah. I, I, yeah, I guess I wasn't, I didn't have like a total plan, I guess. Is that, you know? <laughs> That, that that's that's fair that's a perfectly valid uh and good way to li live live your life of course um so what um so so then you end up you end up in your field uh you end up here at mcmaster and you uh you know you know with with uh with cliff burges uh working on you know black hole related problems is this like when you were looking for research opportunities um, did you entertain many different uh, possible fields um, or did, did you know exactly what you wanted to, to do once you got to grad school? I guess um, I was definitely really specifically interested in high energy physics. Okay. So I applied to other schools in the area, uh, kind of almost worked with somebody who was in kind of string theory, uh, kind of starting up my master's, but Cliff just kind of had this, um, he just seems a little bit outside the box in the way he thinks about a lot of high energy physics topics. So I, I really got kind of just drawn to him and his style eventually, but it was, yeah, I, I, it was pretty restricted to high energy physics because I loved quantum mechanics throughout my whole undergrad. That was like my favorite. That was just like my bread and butter. And then I did a little particle physics course at the very end of my undergrad, which also went well for me and i just kind of that was the thing that really clicked with me i was like this is this is hell interesting you know so that was that was pretty restrictive to that kind of field right from the get-go yeah yep. um but of course there's very many different subfields like yeah as i was saying the string theory seemed interesting for some time but um yeah cliff cliff was yeah there's something very interesting about the way that cliff thinks about these topics that uh just yeah I got attracted to McMaster basically because of that. So. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it seems like a it seems like a good group. You guys are really, you guys are really uh, productive. Um, so, so I'm guessing, at, like as was I, I was very drawn to theoretical physics because of these books uh, by by Brian Greene and Michio Kaku, and things like that. Do you, do you think that affected, you know, sort of the direction you wanted to to take? the math of physics or like your mathematical inclination in physics or do you think it, it was just also you know it was just you took those classes you did well you were interested in them probably a bit of a combination of both like it was the way those books kind of pitch all those huge ideas about supersymmetry and right it's it's very like grandiose and you know as a high school student reading those it's just it seems very very cool so there's probably something in there that 
did make me more interested in it. But at the end of the day, it was just the way I just love quantum mechanics so much that that was kind of really what made me think, okay, maybe I can do this. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, qu yeah, quantum mechanics is definitely a head turner. That, that was really the, I mean, for me, it was thermal and quantum mechanics. Like I mm -hmm. took them at the same time and it was just like, I want to do both of these at the same, yeah. at the, <laughs> at the same time. Cause it, it's such a, I don't know. Do, do you remember if there was a particular thing in quantum mechanics that was sort of like a head turner for you or it was just the whole subject? Yeah, I guess the, the it's it's got such a clean structure. There's just such a, like there's certain subjects where it can be kind of, it seems like a smattering of methods and there's not really like a rule book for doing things. Like I like how organized the framework is kind of for solving problems. And, and so that was like the main thing, just like the structure of it. But I guess the main thing was in the last chorus where you started talking about entanglement and stuff like that. And um, kind of somewhat coming towards uh, what I'm doing now, like this uh, kind of when you, when you have tensor products of Hilbert spaces, the way it, it just all seemed so interesting and clean and, and formal. And I, I really did like that. I, that was kind of what, what made it so attractive to me. There was other classes like electromagnetism where it, it kind of just seemed like there was like, they just throw a problem at you and then, you either know how to solve or you don't, right? There's not really <laughs> yeah. a layout for how to kind of do it. I mean, that's not always the case in QM, but uh, yeah, there's there's uh, there's just like a very clean set of rules to it that I that I really appreciate. So, yeah, yeah, I guess I yeah I, I definitely feel that like in, in some sense I guess classical like once you get into Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics, then perhaps it feels a lot like quantum mechanics but in a, in a lot of in that sense of it's sort of like a clean formalism and you're sort of always doing there's always there's always some type of formalism or algorithm to get to the right um answer or or yeah. what you might want out of the answer right. but but in a lot of the other courses it's like i feel like um you know it's it's almost like i'm borrowing math techniques uh and a variety of other things from what could possibly be taken from like 10 to 15 different math courses or something yeah so, yeah something like this it doesn't feel clean and quantum mechanics is just especially once you get into like modeling qubits and stuff like that or uh spins it's just you know i, I, I don't know yeah i agree i agree that's very that's a very interesting way to put it it's, it's very beautiful in that sense yeah I, I i agree um yeah and it's it was kind of similar to how you were saying you took thermal and quantum mechanics and like they kind of they, going along together like i had a couple of courses when i was taking quantum mechanics i did like complex analysis at the same same time and stop mech oh, okay and the way that it all kind of like went together also kind of there's certain courses sometimes like they even though it's different teachers teaching them they kind of go hand in hand like they march along to get together uh, towards some kind of story and i that maybe was part of why i fell in love with it so much too yeah yeah that's that, that that's interesting out, out of curiosity um you know how, how was statmax sort of introduced to you what was it uh how was it justified like uh, you know going along with the theme of the channel in some sense how how was statmax justified uh to you why does statmax why did statmax make sense to undergrad greg yeah i mean uh it's funny actually so i got introduced to it in actually a thermodynamics course Okay. Uh, which was being taught by uh, Avery Broderick at Perimeter. He's one of the guys on the team that took the picture of the black hole. Oh, okay. That's, that's an interesting yeah. connection. Yeah, and he uh, he kind of was supposed to teach thermodynamics just kind of from the bare bones. And then he said, he was like, I, I want to teach you StatMec, you know, in this course. And, like, uh, he basically kind of built up thermodynamics from StatMec. Interesting. When, and, like, most of the class was like, why are you teaching us this? Like, I thought we were supposed to be learning about, you know, heat and, and, and Carnot cycles and whatever, right? Um, and then when there was an actual StatMec course later on in the year, we started off with the prof and he's like, okay, so I heard from some students that you guys all actually know StatMec already. So <laughs> I guess this is all going to be reviewed for you guys, you know? But yeah, he did a really cool job introducing things. He I remember the first day he came in with a bunch of pennies and he had us all flip pennies for the first like 10 minutes of the class in different groups. Yeah. And he had to plot kind of how the, inst the number of instances of heads and tails. And then I can't exactly remember the, the way that he uh, formulated everything, but he had us like 
live action plot a Gaussian curve of like the distribution of you know nice scales, and then kind of just to illustrate how stats runs the world, right? And yeah. I, I, it's probably one of the most memorable classes for my undergrad. Actually, is I always remember that one. That's definitely a that's that's a really cool experience. I feel I feel like statmec can sometimes be boiled down to sort of uh, you know shut shut up and calculate in some sense for a lot of a lot of courses because it's just like there's so many things you can do with statmec and it's obviously very useful to go through a bunch of example problems, but like that can get sort of lost in translation of like what are we what are we actually doing here? Right. In, in right, some sense. Right. And I, I like I like that he he sort of flipped it on its head. I feel I feel like most people. Hey, Yule, it, long time no see. I haven't done a, a a stream in a while. Glad to see you. Uh, glad to see you here. Of course. Um, I, I I feel like a lot of people learned thermal first, and of course thermodynamics is like empirically true. You know, they came up with those laws uh, from experiment and observation, right? But to to get it from. Uh, to get it from microscopic uh, physics, you need statmec first, right? Of course. So there's mm -hmm. that age-old question of like, what should you? I don't know if it's an age-old question. It's a question I have, I guess. <laughs> what should you teach first? Thermodynamics right. was invented first, or was, yeah. was probably more fleshed out first. But um, uh, do, do you think that that helped your your understanding of thermodynamics to sort of not be introduced to these? these thermodynamic laws uh, like at face value and then um... yeah i think so actually right because like and i just read this the other day actually that like around the time when thermodynamics was being formulated there was a competing theory where they thought um heat was a bunch of particles they, 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 they there was like a physical theory of heat as where it's just like individual particles and that's why we felt things as being warm and whatever, right? And like thermodynamic won out, of course, right? Yeah. As the theory at the time, right? So to me, it kind of feels like having like an understanding of where that's coming from, from the ground up, I, I do think that's helpful, right? Like, cause probably when they came up with those thermodynamic laws, it wasn't from that more kind of fundamental point of view. Yeah. So I, I do, I for me, I, I found it beneficial, but I don't know. Uh, then again, I, I don't think I'd be very good at calculating, you know, Carnot cycle uh, efficiencies and stuff like that either, right? It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for someone who obsesses over statistical mechanics all the time, I, I definitely don't feel super confident in my thermodynamics yeah. <laughs> abilities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can get you to thermodynamics. I can't do anything with thermodynamics. Exactly, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> you see the formalism right yeah <laughs> yule if you're still here i'm really curious to know your thoughts on the um on me and greg's collaboration you know what do you think of the of the style and um and and of course the editing uh we we were both very excited to to get the video out and i definitely want to try uh more videos like that with greg and, and with other with other people I'd, I'd be interested to hear your feedback um yeah that's, a, that's definitely really interesting i i guess i'm i'm yeah for 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 personal reasons for like and it's probably just a value judgment i, I definitely think statmec should come first just because mm -hmm. it's i don't know like i i just find arguments that go like from from microscopic physics and build upwards i just find those to be much more convincing and or, or not not much more convincing in some sense but more more rich yeah if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah and kind of when you uncover the laws as a kind of immediate consequence of some kind of fewer assumptions i don't know that's that's always i don't know i think that's desirable right so so yule says the cloud was cool the uh, the interventions were nice i thought they were timed very well how did the topic come to be it's very specific and had surprising implications well i'm glad that the interventions were nice and um this was actually me and Greg shot this after the video that's going to come out uh, with James Lambert uh, sometime soon. So I apologize if those interventions. I, I'm actually quite uh, like a little self conscious about those <laughs> about those interventions because because it was like I learned a lot from shooting with James and then the and then the one with Greg was you know I felt like I I personally did a better job of being the host. Um, so I'm I'm glad that uh, the ones uh, with Greg 
uh, ended up coming in uh, nice. So the topic came to be because, you know, uh, Greg and I are in a journal club together and we talk about um, uh, statistical mechanics uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, a while back, Greg wrote this uh, paper that sort of got me uh, excited because it was like a black hole thermalizing, uh, I think it was a pair of qubits. Was it a pair of qubits or just one qubit? A, a single qubit. A single, yep. yeah, a single qubit. And it just sort of like he ended up getting an analytical form of uh, like the canonical ensemble. And I, just, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, to be honest, I was completely ignorant that these types of techniques um, sort of existed and were sort of that robust. So we started chatting about that. And then um, when I was looking for collaborators, uh, James came, came to mind, James Lambert, and then Greg also came to mind as, as sort of like obvious first choices. Um, and then Greg and I started talking and it sort of became obvious that we needed some background before he introduced these, this, this thermalizing qubit with the black hole. We needed, we needed something like, something like the open quantum systems thing, um, to sort of give the audience background so that the conversation could be, you know, sort of closed within my channel or maybe the YouTube sphere, if that makes sense. Um, and, uh. Yeah, and I, and I definitely think open quantum systems, like, on their own, I mean, they're super useful for StatMech and many body physics-related problems. So I, f I felt like it it really fit into the theme of uh, the theme of the channel, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so so just uh, one, more, one more question about your undergrad StatMech experience. What, when did, did you ever get into topics like ergodicity or you know, statistical inference, you know, maximum entropy principles, or was it sort of like, did, or did you get the standard, um, I think it's called the principle of equal probability or something like this? Right. Yeah. I'd say it was kind of more the standard treatment. Um, kind of, I, I probably should have reviewed this before this chat, but. <laughs> well, I, uh, I apologize for put you, putting you on the, on this. I'm very, I'm I'm currently thinking about and sort of gathering information about doing a sort of a, a video about how people justify classical statistical mechanics, sort of like, mm -hmm. sort of like you know they do the quantum mechanics ones where it's like you know many worlds or Bohmian mechanics, sort right, of like doing right. a parallel to that. But like, how do you actually get like what do you what are you assuming and what do you think you're doing mm -hmm. doing Statmec? I guess like it was quite from the it was quite was quite built up from like a low level like where there was a kind of like a bath and whatever degrees of freedom you're looking at and like deriving i can't remember exactly what the argument goes but it's like a kind of taylor series argument where you derive a boltzmann distribution where a probability is proportional to you know e to the minus beta times the energy you're looking at right yeah in your system and then kind of just going from there and we we, we got to some kind of like more complicated models. We, we derived some density of states for, you know, where you have a, you know, a probability of being within this many particles within this far out of your sphere in, in, uh, in phase space, things like this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of just going off my memory here. Um, but it was, it was quite clear in how like the distinction between microstates, uh, canonical ensembles, micro canonical ensembles, right? So he, the guy's name was uh, Jeff Chen, who was my professor in this kind of full stat my course I did, and he kind of very clearly separated different concepts, um, which I I think I really appreciated actually, yeah. So, but yeah, as far as things like ergodicity, that was a that was a word I heard much later on. <laughs> I like see. For, yeah. For sure. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess true. I I don't think I really until I got into research, I don't think I really even questioned why something like statmac or thermal should work. I just sort of took it at right, face value. Does. Right. Yeah. It, it, it didn't seem mysterious to me because it mm -hmm. it wasn't presented as something mysterious. But but now I find it profoundly mysterious. <laughs> right. right. So what would you say is the most kind of mysterious facet of this? You probably talked about this on the channel already, but I, I'm curious. What what do I think it is? Yeah, I I, so I think curious. I think it's I think it's so strange that you start with something like quantum mechanics, that is so weird, right? 
And mm. pe- people obviously talk about going to the classical limit and stuff like that. But then, but then you want to start talking about things like um, I can I can model a material or my everyday life with something very trivial like temperature. Mm-hmm. Like why, why looking at quantum mechanics or even like the Newtonian laws of motion, I find it incredibly strange that all of that can just be washed away into these st- either depending on your interpretation or what uh, area you're looking at, either statistical inference um, or you can or or like something like eigenstate thermalization is true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then when you when you actually get down to it, it's like something 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 much more interesting has to be going on here in in the quantum sense because there, there's no reason to believe the state you're working with is the thermal state. Right, right. Um, uh, or, or should give you uh, expectation values that look like the thermal state. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, so Yule's asking, so it, 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 you sort of made it sound like you, you almost started StatMech with the canonical ensemble. Right, in the, in the I mean, in a, in a sense I did. So in this kind of a toy model of this cubic coupled to the thermal bath, I'm assuming kind of the quantum state that the thermal bath is starting in, it's it's thermal. So uh, you're basically the way that that information comes into the calculation is, you know, these correlation functions. Yeah. And there there's a very specific form these take when you're in like a perfectly thermal state. So in a way, this is kind of a difference between what John does and what I do is John is looking for how did things come, become thermal? And I'm kind of just saying, okay, here, the bath's thermal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and let's see what happens when you start, you know, letting things talk to that thermal bath, what, what happens to them? Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I did basically just start out with a canonical ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. At the bottom line. Which, which I think is probably fair, right? Like I, I think we talked about this in the past when you, when you do an open quantum system, I get, well, I guess the question is, is like, what, what's the first thermal bath? But like, once you have one, then you can make as yeah. many as you want, right? Yeah, absolutely. And kind of what's the way that I kind of got interested in thermal physics was because I kind of was looking at gravitational quantum physics with my supervisor, Cliff. And the, the way you start learning about thermality there is whenever there's a horizon, there's often some notion of a temperature. So... The most famous one is when you have a you know a not a non-spinning black hole, a short shield black hole. Uh, there happens to be a temperature associated with the size of the horizon, how big the short shield radius is. Yeah. And kind of the way when you when you do those calculations, you you have this kind of static background uh, of a black hole, and you couple some quantum system to it. Usually, it's some scalar quantum fields, some not zero spin quantum field and uh you you run through the math and you realize the, the presence of this horizon makes the field be in a thermal state there's a there's a ter- temperature so it's kind of in those calculations you're just kind of handed a thermal state which is kind of weird so you're in, in that setting too you're kind of just you take it for granted there's a there's a temperature here yeah yeah yeah. So, so Yule says I meant I meant when he first learned about StatMech, it was surprise. It, it, he, uh, and I, I, I guess, I guess, yeah. Uh-huh. So, so when, uh, when you sort of started out, when you were first learning StatMech, that you sort of started with a canonical ensemble. Yeah, was, I mean, I guess, I guess that's, I guess that's what it was. It was, uh, again, I'm going off of a six years or seven years probably since i took that course but that was how i remember uh dr chen starting up that course um, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting mm-hmm. approach i'm sure there's some like law like i you must have had like a micro canonical ensemble sort of assumed in there to get that derivation to work right i i believe so i believe so um so so you'll says wow that's very surprising to me we started out with ergodicity on a very basic level and then partition ensembles and so on yeah i I think i think that's ergodicity is a really satisfying way and somewhat convincing way to to justify it because it's like you know like what you know what what is calculating these equilibrium properties really mean and then you can say well it's just equal to time averages of your Mm -hmm. underlying stuff and that 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 that, that, you know when i first heard that i thought that was really cool Mm -hmm. It it seems very uh it, it is a very beautiful way to to sort of understand it 
yeah, I guess I guess that's yeah. So it sounds like you yeah you did the. And I think most textbooks do that, where they sort of start out with sort of like a equal probability for the microstates, and then and then okay, we can jump into the canonical ensemble right away by just assuming that we're coupled to a system that's like somewhat somewhat bigger, and then there's some some assumptions there that you know the the interaction on the boundaries isn't too too big because then it, like that sort of gets a little complicated but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it was yeah exactly and kind of it was an introductory course too so it would be nice to kind of go over those assumptions again in a way how, how that was all presented um because yeah it was kind of what was also nice is just kind of introducing entropy as basically the number of microstates in your system right that was yeah. that was kind of the big thing where you're like okay that's what it is and that's kind of a nice definition of entropy right because it was it's yeah. there's there seems to be so many <laughs> so <laughs> it's i think it gives a very coherent and logical way of understanding it right yeah. that that's really why i wanted to make that my, my i think it was like my maybe my third video or maybe it was my second video like what is what is entropy because you can you can go on youtube and you can find entropy explained at a variety um, of levels and everyone sort of like says that everyone else is saying it wrong and of course i'm now saying everyone else is saying it wrong but so i'm just adding to the conversation uh but yeah i really like that i, I really like that sort of definition because then it leads straight into you know the you know we are we are doing a statistical inference here um and this is just relating uh, you know, in my opinion, I guess, to the Shannon entropy and through information theory, you can then make really strong arguments for why statistical mechanics, uh, should be true and why the ensembles, uh, should look the way they look mm -hmm. basically. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I, yeah, I really, yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that, yeah. That's a really nice way of understanding entropy rather than making it seem, uh, mysterious and, and something like. I don't know when you when you learn thermodynamics on your own, which is what I what I was first exposed to. It almost seemed like mysterious. It felt it felt like untouchable and un like you couldn't understand it. But yeah, but the bolt like you know the Boltzmann entropy is like very understandable. It's so simple, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then compounded with that is that I find that there's not a lot of great thermodynamics textbooks out there that yeah. explain things very well. Like the the classic one that I had, had to deal with as a TA and also when I took thermodynamics was uh, I think the Schroeder thermal physics book. And it was for me quite difficult to grasp anything beyond just calculating things. Like what was the deeper kind of meaning? Yeah. Off. So not to call out that particular book in general, but it's a, it's something I've heard uh, in general about the subject too, from other people that, yeah, it's, I think it's a tricky subject to teach actually kind of very opposite from quantum mechanics that there's yeah there isn't this specific kind of procedure for explaining how it works and what are the rules right it's yeah in, in some sense there is but it's yeah it's it's a little bit more uh loose in a way i don't know <laughs> for <laughs> yeah for sure so so you know something that we've talked about and i, I will probably continue uh talking about it in in i think the uh the third video or maybe it was the second video i don't remember um we talked about the fact that the bath was in fact in a canonical ensemble uh no doubt for obvious um i think a lot of people assume on uh, canonical ensembles because they're much easier to do analytics uh with right so i'm wondering it uh you know I mean, we've talked about this before can you relax that condition potentially like do you do you need do you need a canonical ensemble um, could it potentially be a microcanonical ensemble and you could get similar results, but they'd be much more tedious or could they, could the bath be just a system that obeys eigenstate thermalization? <laughs> it, yeah. Um, it, it could really, that that's, what's kind of nice. So the way that information comes into the calculation is always through correlation functions in the bath, essentially. That's, yeah. that's really when at least you're calculating things in terms of this Schrodinger picture kind of. Those are these di dynamical correlation functions in particular, right? Or is it just yeah? Okay. Exactly, like they're they're exactly they're time dependent, and so in principle, you could really pick the state to be almost anything you want, uh, and it's just a question of what those correlation functions are doing. So what so, what do we need them to do? 
Uh, I mean, depending on what you want to do. I mean, the, the main thing we're always looking for is, are we going to go towards if we couple a qubit or several qubits to this thermal bath? Are there, is there going to, is it going to approach thermality? I see. So that, that's kind of largely where we're looking at the picture, the, the kind of way we're looking at in, at, a in our research and at baseline, there's a certain property that these correlation functions have to obey. It's called this Kuba Martin Schwinger condition. Okay. It's just a certain kind of symmetry, uh, for, that these correlation functions have to obey. So that's at baseline, what you'd need to guarantee you go to a thermal state. If you had something, some more complicated bath, I'm not sure you'll satisfy some, a condition like that, but I don't see why you couldn't, uh, thermalize still in that, in that situation. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, the, yeah, I'm, I'm guess I'm, I'm not sure how, like the, the way that these interactions are built usually. So when I'm talking about interactions, I mean, you have an interaction Hamiltonian for your system coupling to the bath in a specific way. Is there usually some kind of local interaction where your probe, your open system probe, like the qubit or whatever, it's localized to a certain region of space kind of, or a parameter space associated with the bath. And so it's really the, just the correlation functions in that particular region of the environment that you care about. So in the qubit example, the qubit's on some specific trajectory through the thermal bath, like it's maybe sitting there at rest in the thermal bath. What you care about are the autocorrelation functions, self-correlation functions along that trajectory kind of in along the qubit's world line, let's say. Yep. So that's where it's really going to be important to know what the properties of these correlators are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly where the interaction is going on. So. Okay. That's that's really interesting. So so I guess you know we you know, we talked about open quantum systems, then we're sort of like dipping our toes a little bit in your research with these uh, explanations. I guess it might be fun to move into actual like actually discussing uh, your research or what what you're interested in um, and why using open quantum systems in particular in your field uh, is sort of like an interesting uh, path forward. So so perhaps a fun question is, to ask is, you know, what's the big picture question that sort of drives research in your field? Or, or maybe you can start us off with precisely defining what your field uh, is and then jump into like, what's the big, what's the big topic that you're trying to contribute to? Well, so the kind of the big picture is understanding effective field theories of gravity. Yeah. So, so these are where you start to think of gravity as a quantum mechanical object, um, and kind of the approach that, you know, quantum gravity fields usually take is like, you've got this very specific set of equations for how gravity should behave. So you'll, you'll have loop quantum gravity or string theory or whatever. And, um, that then that, that's a, it's a very strong statement about what gravity is doing at high energy scales yeah so for effective field theories of gravity you're looking at kind of a low energy limit of what the gravitational field is doing and uh and kind of you'll, you'll hear a lot of talk about how gravity is non-renormalizable which is kind of why we need to solve the problem of quantum gravity is let's come up with a theory that is renormalizable where, well, it turns out for effective field theories, you absolutely do not care about renormalizability. So when you have an effective field theory of gravity, you don't really care that it's not renormalizable. You're just like trying to solve things to a particular order. Mm -hmm. You're, and, uh, and you don't care that there's, you know, you can't remove divergences to all orders in your perturbation. So, it turns out that gravity as an effective field theory is just a, is a well-defined thing to study. Really? Okay. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and so people, uh, do calc, you can calculate scattering cross sections for what the, you know, the graviton or the, uh, kind of, a the gravitational particle, um, what, what it, what it, how it would scatter in a certain background, let's say. So like kind of the procedure would be that you have some background solution to the Einstein equations, which, so, you know, to GR's general rel relativity's equations, uh, let's say like Schwarzschild or something like that. And then 
if you want to consider kind of quantum fluctuations about that solutions, you'll, you'll take that as your background field and add some tiny perturbation to the background solution, basically. So there's, uh, um, and, and, and the idea is that you'll, you'll treat this small perturbation this is, as a quantum field. And, and this is what kind of, that's what you're trying to calculate things with in effective field theories of gravity. And so now that's that's kind of the big picture. We'd like to understand these EFTs of gravity, but whenever there is a horizon present, um, these theories kind of start to become wonky. There, there's kind of uh, there's a very well defined way of dealing with effective field theories that we're familiar with, like when we're studying particle physics, let's say, where you've just got flat Minkowski space. And uh, you've got some quantum fields that are, you know, describing electrons or muons and so on. Uh, so th there's a very well-defined, it's called the Wilsonian effective field theory. There's a, there's a well-defined procedure for dealing with those types of EFTs. And so whenever there's a horizon present, it turns out these theories are kind of a little bit strange and different um, than this Wilsonian paradigm that people are most often used to dealing with. And uh so kind of one class of these effective field theories are so-called open effective field theories where you essentially have this splitting between one part of the system that you can't make measurements on and another part of the system where you can make measurements on and that splitting that what defines that splitting is a horizon basically so it's, in a, in a, in a, this is kind of what i was saying in the third part of my uh uh, video with you, John, is that kind of there's there's this natural splitting that occurs by the definition of a horizon. And the idea is, can we write down some rules for how this effective field theory of gravity might work for in the sector that we actually care about, which is, you know, the sector external to the black hole, let's say. Okay, that's interesting. That, that's the big picture, kind of, how do we how do we understand these open effective field theories, which are more complicated than standard Wilsonian effective field theories. So that's kind of where this line of research kind of begins. And it's not, it's, I mean, as, as in all topics in physics, it's, there's a, some small number of people working on this problem. It's right. It's, it's not a huge community, but, um, the, the idea here is kind of one of the signs that you're dealing with an open EFT whenever there's a horizon there is you'll see this problem of secular growth. So you'll calculate something, calculate some observable, um, and you'll find that it, has, it suffers this secular growth problem, which is your, an EFT is by definition, some you're perturbing in something small. So yeah. that's what you're doing all the time in effective field theory. You're doing perturbation theory over and over. And then there's this kind of surprise that happens is Oh wait a minute! We calculate this observable in, in perturbation theory, and then it's blowing up at late times, and it's 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 kind of a weird observation when you first make it. But then, that's what's nice about this open quantum systems connection is once you know about that, uh, that secular growth is kind of a commonly encountered problem in that area of study. It kind of it's, it stops being surprising. You're just it's it's just a feature of perturbation theory. It doesn't always work at late times. Yeah. And uh, and open quantum systems gives you these tools to resum these late time divergences to get some kind of uh, logical late time uh, solutions. So that's these tools suddenly become very interesting for studying these open EFTs, uh, like from that point of view. And uh, it turns out that kind of so this problem of a qubit coupled to a thermal bath that's kind of in a way like a toy problem it's not fundamentally what you'd be interested in exploring it's actually like the quantum fields themselves so you would you would like you you could put a electron field an electromagnetic field let's say and you want to be able to describe what it's doing in a in a in a gravitational background when there's a horizon let's say that would be kind of the big picture goal and um it turns out that if you're just focusing on the kind of region external to the black hole, the open system part, let's say more precisely, there's all these effects from open quantum systems apply. So you can have decoherence happening. Um, 
energy dissipation, all, all this, all this type of stuff. And um, that's the kind of, it's, it's, it's a, it's a it, open quantum systems gives you kind of just a set of tools that kind of give you just a different point of view uh, for how to, to understand how these things work. And it's not by no means the only way to understand these issues. Mm -hmm. And to, there's, uh, but it's, it's I, to me, it's a very interesting one. So, yeah. Uh, that's that's interesting. You, you Yule said if you had to bet money right now, are you in the camp of string theory, loop quantum gravity, M O N D? I don't really know what that is, and, or, uh, or something else. I think that's like uh, modified uh, gravity. I think it's like kind of alternatives to uh, dark matter. If, if I'm if I'm uh, uh, if I'm right, but um, honestly, you will to I. <laughs> I I feel so inadequate to answer that question because I know just next to nothing about any of these. The truth there's so many people working on string theory that are just amazing researchers and the fact that it gets so much attention and they're all betting that it's it's the right way to think about things. I think that has a lot of weight to me. I would kind of maybe lean towards string theory. But uh, truly, it's like I, I I don't feel confident actually answering it at all. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I think that's very boring answer in a way. I, <laughs> I'm saying I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a there's of course criticism of string theory, right? But like one argument for it is kind of whenever it's often been the case that people come up with some new idea and then you know these these string folks find a way to kind of encapsulate it in string theory again so it seems just to be a very powerful formalism yeah maybe formalism is a strong word i think people would argue it's not necessarily a formalism but just a bunch of ideas we're not sure exactly how to describe string theory yet but um yeah so so when we talk about these problems and you're, and you're in particular you're you're interested in, in having some form of thermality you know in, in the techniques that or or producing some, some thermality that you're that you're talking about like what why 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 do we care about the thermality or like what's the physical justification for using a canonical ensemble in your field that's is it the black hole is the because the black hole like it, it has some temperature associated with it so it, yeah. is, is that is that why it's i mean that's what's so weird about it is it's it's a very different philosophy from the one you're taking like the first person to kind of discover this stuff was Hawking I believe there's yep. some hints there before that but he was really the big big person to discover that and um he calculated some observables and he saw wait a minute this has this is this is this is what a thermal state would give you he said this is kind of weird kind of, it was a surprise that there's a thermality built into these systems i see so it's like already okay it's kind of there already in it's a certain way already. yeah and i i don't have a very clean understanding if there is some clean way of understanding it from like a statmic point of view but this kind of result of thermality of black holes let's say it's been proven in so many different ways but it's always kind of like because they're they're maximum scramblers in some sense, so they should, right? I guess they should maximally thermalize, maybe, if that's a word. Yeah. I don't. I, I've yeah. never I've never heard or read that in particular, but perhaps that's a thing. There, I mean, there is a huge amount of people doing kind of like a quantum information, yeah, aspect of black holes, and it's not really research I'm super familiar with, but um, that I I, I definitely think there's some concepts there like that are they seem important to me but i don't know i'm not i'm not an expert at the end of the day so i, I don't feel very confident saying anything that, that's fair yeah but um it's the what i want to just emphasize is and then there, there's other places then suddenly after hawking's discovery then they, they found out that you you can have in, in de sitter space you have a notion of a temperature so the sitter space is approximately what our universe behaves like on the largest of scales. It's kind of an expanding space time. So 
everybody's heard that the universe is constantly expanding and accelerating in its expansion. So approximately the sitter space describes that. And there is a no, there is a horizon in the sitter space, an event horizon, very similar to the one we have in, in a, a black hole space time. And it turned out that there's, there's a temperature associated with that too. So there's, there's okay. thermal physics built in there as well. How, there's, is there, can you, can you give us a reason for why that should be built in or is it an assumption or it's, it's, it's exactly the same flavor as the Hawking calculation It's kind of like, there's a horizon, you calculate these observables and voila, everything's in the thermal state, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of bizarre. I, I, I bet you there are people kind of more fundamentally working on this stuff that could give a better answer than that. But, uh, there is kind of a theorem, which says that whenever there's a horizon, there's a temperature basically in this, in these, in these, in these gravitational space times, um, see. which is bizarre, even in, uh, Minkowski space, the, there's a famous example of the Unruh effect, which um, is basically you, if you look at this flat space time, which is just this, you know, the most boring space time possible. If you look at it from an accelerated point of view, suddenly in a, a, like an artificial horizon appears. There's a, there's a sense in which you can define an event horizon in that kind of state of motion. And a temperature appears again. It's called the unroot temperature. And the temperature is proportional to how fast you're accelerating through that space time. So it's it's uh it's somewhat mysterious, at least to me. Oh uh, uh, sounds very it, mysterious uh, to me as well. That sounds like a very fascinating trying to trying yeah. to explain. I mean perhaps perhaps there is a really good explanation for that, but Yeah, yeah. Sounds very fun. Yeah, and then kind of uh kind of there's a side point, but the unroot effect these unrecalculations in Minkowski space times, they're the kind of playground where people, it's the most easiest to calculate things because it's just flat space time. So that's usually like a lot of, a lot of papers kind of start there because yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the easiest place to start, let's say. I see. The, every, there are actual analytical closed form solutions to, <laughs> to your, to your problems there, which is not the case in short field space. Like, Hawking had to take just like a plethora of approximations to get the Hawking effect as his answer. Yeah, that's that, that's very fascinating. What, what, one of the things that I find very interesting about modern research in condensed matter physics um, and many body physics, statmec research, etc., is that um, e even if you're uh, just trying to do um, condensed matter systems, there odds are you're going to find yourself reading a paper about black hole physics. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very strange. I never expected <laughs> that connection to happen coming into grad school. Like I, I had exposure to eigenstate thermalization in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I definitely didn't see myself reading, uh, papers about black hole physics and like actually mm -hmm. that having a big impact on my research, but it, yeah, yeah, it's a very fascinating connection that we have going on right now. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's weird all these uh kind of uh yeah these 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 couplings of these these comparisons you can make in, in all these fields like this of course the big famous one too is this ads cft connection right between uh conformal field theories and then anti de sitter space gravities like there how you have these kind of duels going on it seems to happen in so many places and I don't know exactly what that means, but it's yeah, it's spooky and, and, and interesting. Like, yeah, that's why I don't know. Like, it's it's almost like you know, in, in in one sense, I want, um, you know, I I, I guess I did, I I didn't think of it. Uh, you know, Yule says, uh, um, uh you know, the, the connection is very specific, I, I, I guess, between, you know, getting, getting from what the channel has been about so far to, uh, to what you talked about at the end of your third video. And I, I can definitely see that it, it does, it does feel very, it does feel very specific. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, you wrote a paper and, you know, I, I work on condensed matter models, mostly I would say, because they're, they're much easier to work with mathematically, um, and, and numerically, 
but then you wrote a paper and I'm absolutely fascinated by the results of your paper. <laughs> you know, like I, I find that I find that very fascinating that uh, that the physics is so transferable uh, right now and everyone can be. I mean, not not just not just excited because it's physics and we all love physics, but also excited because, um, you know, it sort of adds to 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 more and more stories across the aisle. And in many cases. Yeah, right. Exactly. And then back to your point about condensed matter, there's this uh, researcher in our, in our department, right? Sunsick Lee. Yes. Who, that paper, right, where it was a condensed matter system, which he proved was just a black hole. And it just it was like a literal one to one mapping. Oh, really? And, okay. Yeah, and this is uh, that, that was, I think, Dr. Lee's just craziest result. I think that's kind of really what put him in the in the spotlight. And it, it was because it was just so surprising. Why? Why? Why does it have to be that way? You know, it's yeah. Why? Why would a condensed matter system look like a black hole? Yeah. Why would the physics look the same? Yeah. So can you give more examples of black hole papers entering your condensed matter system sphere? So, so, uh, so I think that the, the biggest one right now that's been like sort of in my face for, uh, for a while is, um, uh, Maldacena. And I believe there are other names on the paper and I apologize to anyone, you know, if you ever watched this, that I didn't mention you, uh, in particular, um, I haven't pulled up the paper in a while, is, is the paper uh, called Abound on Chaos. And they were in particular interested in black hole physics, um, I believe. And they, they proved that um, like this out of time ordered correlator thing, uh, this, this quantity that, I, that I've written uh, uh, two papers on, um, another one on, on the way now too, um, you can sort of up uh, under under some assumptions. Uh, you can you can upper bound the way this out of time ordered correlator grows in time, um, and you know, so you get e to the power of some Lyapunov exponent times time, and you can bound how big the the Lyapunov exponent is uh, with respect to the temperature. Um, of of the black hole i believe is what um what ends up happening in the paper and this ignited a wave of interest in the condensed matter community uh, the community that's really interested in how things thermalize and go to thermodynamic equilibrium so there's been a lot of um you know big uh big waves of of, of people looking at uh scrambling in particular in a variety of uh, of uh of systems uh, from from cold atoms to you know regular condensed matter systems, spin systems, uh, etc. So that was probably my first exposure to it. And I think that's probably the most famous example that comes to mind right now. Are you are you familiar familiar with that paper, Greg? I I've kind of not. I haven't really read it to a detail, but I I, I know of it. I'm, I, yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. It see it seems like every time I write a paper on Otox, that's like one of the first citations that mm -hmm. that that goes in. It, it's a really impactful paper, mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of the first. Yeah, it was definitely the first connection that I was made aware of um, when I was doing uh, this uh, this research. Mm -hmm. So so we're at eight, but I feel like I didn't ask you everything I wanted to ask you. Do you, do you mind sticking around for a little a little longer? Absolutely, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, all right. So so uh, something that's really fun to to talk about. You know, there might there might be a student who who wants to know what it's like working in your field, maybe just in high energy in particular, or in your field in uh in your field in your field specifically. Um. Like going into graduate school and then where you are now, what sort of tools do you think uh, were necessary to become, you know, sort of proficient uh, in your in your field? Like if, if you could make recommendations to people, things to work on, uh, things to get good at. I So to me, the biggest and best piece of advice I ever got was from Cliff when I first started my master's, which took me two years to appreciate <laughs> okay. kind of ignored not ignored it but i i didn't kind of absorb it properly for a long time which it's a he kind of he says this to all of his students he gives it's a commencement speech by weinberg 
uh, Steven Weinberg um, at, at some university. And, and it's kind of explaining what's his advice to new physicists. And it's that don't try to learn everything about what you're trying to do. Just dive in. Okay. Do the problem. Just just try calculating something and don't worry too much about, you know, knowing everything about the field because you'll never will know it. It's just kind of get your hands dirty and you'll pick up the pieces that you need along the way. And yeah, so I like that. I, I really like that advice, actually. Like, I, I feel like especially because most people that go into physics are very curious. Yeah. As well. Yeah. You can get like lost in the weeds of like. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's kind of what I meant when I said that the first two years I didn't follow that advice is kind of I just kind of wanted to know everything and I, I just spent so much time just going through the literature and you know most of it you don't really fully learn because you didn't actually do the calculation right there's kind of a difference between reading a paper and actually doing the calculation yourself you, like and, and and I think the deepest form of learning is when you're actually you're the one who did the calculation you that's when you really have the fullest understanding of it so I spent a long time kind of just trying to understand all the literature and then it kind of eventually at this point where I um, started following that advice it's kind of just just follow your nose do the calculation and if there's some little thing you need to look up you'll find something on that specifically and then you can c continue it carrying on and I find that's just a really efficient way of doing research it's because it, exactly like you say you get lost in the weeds so easily there's there's just you can read papers forever. It's like it's an exponential curve. How many papers are coming out on the archive, right? So, yeah, y Yule says uh, he'll steal that advice. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really good advice because you know, on one end, if you do get lost in the weeds, you'll probably come out being um, a much more well-rounded physicist in terms of background knowledge and stuff yeah. like that. But if you want to make progress, counterintuitively, you just need to go. And you need to ignore things that don't feel, you know, you know, incredibly pressing uh, at the time. You you can make real. Uh, of course, you need. Initially, you'll need um, you'll need guidance, and that's what your supervisor is for. But as long as you have guidance and you just push ahead, then you can make real progress on physics problems without having like a full scope. You know, the full, the full, full, full picture. Every, every year I definitely feel like I get a more and more full picture of what's going on yeah in the, the, in my field yeah it kind of the story kind of unveils unveils itself kind of as time yeah. goes on right and then kind of as as to the kind of idea of having like a wide breadth of knowledge like I probably I, I'm definitely not there so I'm, I'm just saying but when I look at someone like my supervisor it's like there's just they've worked on so many problems which touch on so many different subfields. And then because they have an intimate knowledge of those specific calculations, that's kind of seems like that's part of where that huge, like, you know, yes. horizon comes from. It's just experience eventually. So, yeah, it's, it's almost like you can't fully appreciate a field or, or a particular problem until you have a research project under your belt. You, you can read as many papers as you want. You can even convince yourself that you know the argumentation and stuff like that. But until mm -hmm. you sit down and think really, really hard about something, like you're not going to truly appreciate it at the level of, you know, being able to contribute in some meaningful way until you really sit down and work on it. And you, and you of course, don't have enough time in your day or even your lifetime to do that for everything. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's for, yeah. Okay. That, that, yeah, I, I really like that advice for sure. So what does, um, I guess I get the impression, and I'll also I, I apologize, guys, who are watching. It's like whenever I put, uh, pull up my, like, the color of the screen, like, I just completely changes when I pull up the Word document to see what I'm going to ask for next. Um, uh, so I get the impression that, uh, you know, you guys in my, in my group, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of programming, uh, involved. Of course you have to work out what you're going to program. Uh, but a lot of that just ends up being like clever linear algebra. And then the analytics end up being, you know, arguments for probability theory or, uh, maybe bounding things, but the calculations end up being very short once you get to the right answer, if that makes sense. Like the, cal yes. the calculations aren't long, but I get the impression that you guys just chip away at calc like analytical calculations 
all yes. day, every day. So what, what does a day look like? What is a, what does a research program look like in your field? Yeah. Um, so that was, that was part of the kind of bottleneck of surviving like the first couple years of masters. It was, is it's not so much programming, although sometimes there's some numerics I do have to do kind of plot some stuff, let's say, um, but yeah, it's, it's mostly just analytics and it, uh, so my day to day is really just crunching mostly in tech format, just, just lines after lines of, 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 of analytics essentially. Yeah. So that's, it's, especially since the pandemic, I'm, you know, I'm in front of a screen most of the day doing that. I'm, I'm, I am looking forward to when things open up a little more and th there was a time before COVID where we we're, you know, in an office together talking on a blackboard, let's say, but it's, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of calculations. It's not necessarily anything overly complicated, but it's just, sometimes you just have a very big <laughs> expression that you have to deal with. It's, it's a, yeah. mostly a lot of algebra and I guess some integration, but it's, uh, nothing very not, not very fancy math at all it's just kind of I see. crack of all the dots on your eyes and you know presses on your t's so did you say it, it, I, maybe it looks more intimidating than it actually is once i guess most things are like that to be honest yeah, <laughs> but mo yeah, exactly. mo <laughs> most things look a lot more intimidating than they actually are yeah uh, that, that's, that's how i feel about it for sure it's it's kind of you just <laughs> you have to crunch through it and there's kind of a uh, <laughs> like you have to have the fortitude to actually push it through let's say yeah but uh, it's 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 really just mostly algebra usually <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some thinking involved too but yeah when the, the the that's mostly it's those crunching calculations that i'm spending my time on for the most part yeah so, so yeah. Go, go, going back to the advice that you were giving before yule says i mean even the whole subject is based on that advice in a loose sense you don't do three semesters math first with volume integrals Fourier transforms and then solve your first harmonic oscillator problem. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's definitely yeah. that's definitely that's definitely true. And I feel like yeah, yeah. I, yeah I definitely. Yeah, I yeah. think it's. Uh, I, I I feel like I don't know if uh, my supervisor was telling this to all of his students from the get go, but I think he feels a need to tell all new students because I think he's noticed a pattern that that's what happens to new students is kind of. Yeah. You're, you're a new student you're excited to start your degree you're eager and you want to know everything right so it's kind of but you're 100 percent right like that is kind of how you learn in a way yeah yeah it's, it's, it's almost it's almost obvious when you think about it but i think you get i don't know like when you get into grad school you're so bright-eyed and ready to basically make yourself into an expert that you can sort of like lose focus yeah yeah that, right. which i think is fair it, yeah I, yeah, I definitely, you know, I fall, I fall into that trap right now. Uh, or, I, you know, you, you're always at risk of falling in, back into that trap. Like I have so many things that I want to learn yes. and I could totally just put my research on halt and dedicate all my time. Yeah. I want to caveat what I said as well and say that that happens. It still happens to me all the time. I just go down a rabbit hole reading something I don't really need to know for the project I'm working on, but it, you know, yeah. what's what's currently <laughs> picking away at you right now like what do you want to learn right now that you that you know you probably shouldn't waste your time on so i mean i i i'm very interested in quantum information like yeah. i feel like so many of what i so many topics that i touch on they it can be connected to that so that's something i want to learn more about i just i just i never can, i never feel like i can give myself the time because i you know there's there's papers to finish writing and at all times <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um that's that's a big one i'd say that that's a big one for me yeah yeah how about you for for me um i recently was introduced to a very you know mathematically rigorous side of condensed matter physics where they're particular they're very they're very interested in um uh, ground state physics and they have like so much machinery uh, built up uh, to to talk about these things and produce really nice results in them. And I don't see a lot of overlap in between uh, the names I see in those papers. And I could be wrong on this. Perhaps they are working on it and I just haven't made the connection yet. Uh, I don't see a lot of overlap in between uh, those people and people in my field. So I'm very curious about what they're 
uh, about what they're doing. And I, of course, can follow some of the more simpler proofs, but some of the other proofs use, um, you know, mathematics that I'm not familiar with. And I find, you know, mm-hmm. you know the, the information overload when I'm like, I read a sentence that's, <laughs> it, that's in English, I guess. But then, like, there's so much math jargon baked into it that by the time I'm done Googling everything in the sentence, I don't even know, I don't even know what I, like, I don't know, I don't really know what they're talking about still. You just get to a certain word, you stop there, like, and then, yeah, it's, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I bought, I bought a book that, um, go like overviews all of the stuff in this field. Uh, I think it's called, uh, introduction to, uh, like quantum many body physics or something like this. And it's just mm-hmm. ground state physics more or less. Um, and there, and there were, um, and and they were, um, you are you talking about the, uh, the ground state papers? A a really fun thing to Google right now would be something like Liebschultz Mattis, uh, theorem, for example. And then anything related to something like that, uh, is really interesting. Um, and then to go along with those, like it's a, it's like a whole rabbit hole of like, different things that they've uh, proved um may- maybe you've heard of the leib schultz mattis uh type theorems and then once you- once you get into the stuff of um like now now that they're doing stuff like models without any particular symmetries uh they have they have like i don't know it's it's hard to it- it's hard to appreciate those papers um um, may- maybe I'll make, I, I understand Lieb Schultz Mattis theorem. So I, maybe I can make a video on that at some point and then link to, um, some of those I'm a, papers. I'm a, fan. I'm a fan of that idea. Cause I want to <laughs> learn, learn more about them too, from what you've told me about them. So. Yeah. So sorry, sorry to get, to, to get back to the, um, uh, to, 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 to the story. So, so then I bought this book, but then I also felt like I wasn't appreciating, the math that was in this book that they just sort of assume you know. So then I bought another book to explain that math to me. And then I realized I was unqualified with my math background to learn that one. And I actually needed to go back and do functional analysis. So now I have a functional analysis book that's sort of sitting there and I need to learn it. So then I can le- then learn uh, the like C star algebra book. And then I can then go into the um, actual physics. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like a three way, like the, sorry, three, three books that I need to get through to, to like get the nagging feeling of things that I, that I want to learn right. <laughs> away. But like, that's such a commitment. Like, that's just such a, I don't know, maybe I should sit in on a functional analysis course rather than, uh, or maybe I should find a YouTuber who does it, who, who does a nice, uh, right. <laughs> something about <laughs> An analogous that. channel about functional analysis. <laughs> <laughs> what do <are> you <laughs> why is that so funny that should find a youtuber or yeah <laughs> i do i do in fact have a have a youtuber series that i've saved and, he, and he's been doing functional analysis but i'm only on like episode five and he only does like 10 minute long videos so it's not like i'm it's not like i'm churning through the <laughs> these these things you know I, uh, one, one other thing that came to my mind when you brought the brought up the, the math points of view is it's uh I, geometry is also a big one it's in in particle physics there's so many concepts tied to like mathematical you know geometry like things to do with topology and fiber bundles and stuff like that so um especially like uh when you start talking about the strong nuclear force let's say um and gravity too and it's it's always these things i read those buzzwords and I want to learn about them, but I've never had a calculation where I like actually had to had to use them. But um, it's it's something I feel like I'm missing out on, and I'm I'm reading about it all the time. But mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's uh, maybe one day I'll have time to read about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one day. I I don't know when that day is gonna be. I yeah. plan for it for it to exist, but I don't know when. Because like uh, ne- nearing the end of our PhDs here, I mean, you need to ramp up paper publishing have a good resume right and that exactly. just that, that just means you need to double down on the not learning unnecessary things in some yeah, sense exactly. <laughs> you just have to crank them out at this point right yeah 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 exactly you will <laughs> having to read three books uh just to understand one particular physics thing yeah exactly ba- basically 
ba- yeah. ba- basically like I, I just want to appreciate like a handful of results and to be, and to be perfectly honest with you we might as well call it four because the, like i have i still need to google things when i'm studying functional analysis <laughs> like <laughs> there's still some gaps in my not like i did do some pure math in undergrad but like i'm certainly not uh they're, they're certainly not fresh in my mind yeah <laughs> i know exactly what you mean <laughs> What is a set, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So, okay. So we sort of talked about, uh, so, we're, so we're almost here at the end of everything I wanted to talk about. I got a, a fun question uh, that I like to ask people and you will fr- feel free to answer this as well or anyone else who, who, who hasn't typed yet, but, but is in, in here. Um, do you think that the universe is in a pure state or a mixed state? <laughs> <laughs> or do you think that's a, do you think that's maybe, maybe that's a nonsensical question. I don't I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we could never, we could probably never know. I, my, uh, <laughs> my research would say the observable universe is probably in a mixed state. <laughs> really? really? Well, okay. We, I mean, <laughs> But the whole universe, yeah. So when you when you make an observation, it looks like it's in a mixed state. But I guess that makes sense. Even if you're in a pure state, then looking at something local, that doesn't... Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, I'm kind of half-joking, but there's this problem I'm working on right now, and it has to do with uh, putting a quantum field into De Sitter space and okay. kind of seeing what it does. And then the idea there is that there's parts of the universe we can see and then parts of the universe is kind of out of our scope we can't see yes and we track the part we can see as an open system so okay let's say our observable universe and then you find out that that state evolves into a mixed state it decoheres it loses purity so from that point of view our observable universe i think is in a mixed state but that's all i can say at this point that's, oh, that's a really interesting i've asked this to a few people and i guess you know they sort of like joke around on it philosophically, but like I, I guess that's a really interesting. But then, but then that's an assumption that you have some type of bath for the observable universe, right? Yeah, that, there's a lot built into that. So <laughs> that's really yeah. interesting, though. I, I like that answer. I like I like this answer a lot. Yule says I'm not qualified to answer this question. I don't think anyone on <laughs> Earth is qualified to answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's definitely really interesting. Um, well, I think that's all for the show. Uh, thanks everyone who came to watch. And of course, thanks again, Greg. I look forward to having you, you know, back for more videos and then potentially back for more streams. I I think we're, you know, we've been talking about this, about like some fun streams that we could have. And I, I guess you express interest in the one where, you know, in the future we might do something along the lines of like, um, maybe everyone who is on the stream will bring maybe two or three equations uh, that might not have, you know, the biggest, um, I don't know, fan group, but like, but, you know, like they, they don't get a lot of attention, but they're also very powerful. They're also big results. Mm-hmm. Um, so we might do something fun like that in the future. Uh, so I definitely That's look forward great. to having you on for something like that as well. Um, so it'll be, it'll be a, uh, equation hipsters, right? The yeah. Equation, equation hipsters. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's what we should call it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what we should call the, the i like yeah. that we should call the series equation hipsters <laughs> i love that yeah, that sounds great yeah I'd, I'd love to come and do that and thank you yeah for for having me on it's, yeah it's been a lot of fun yule says thank you it's always uh lots of fun totally worth staying up late yeah th- yeah thank i definitely wow. appreciate the support I, I i need to get back in the habit of having these uh uh, more regularly because they're always they're always really fun it's fun talking to people in the chat uh and then it's fun talking to to, to whoever's on the show so all right well Leave. signing off any uh hopefully hopefully see everyone uh sometime soon thanks a lot john all right i ended the stream that was good i mean there was only 